and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. I'm very grateful to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for this great blessing, blessing that he has given me this morning to celebrate the Divine Eucharist here at St. Mark's Church in Washington, D.C. And it's been quite a while since I've been here, maybe over 10 years, and so it's wonderful to be back. And I want to thank the dear Reverend Fathers of this church, Father Bishoy and Father Anthony and Father Paul, for their great love and for their kind invitation for me to be with you this weekend. And also I'm happy that Father Musa from Long Island is also with us here today and praying with us. And it was really great to see the activities and the expansion that has happened at the church here during this period. And probably the thing that impressed me the most were many things, actually, not just one thing. In particular, the work with the school and the importance that this church is giving to education and religious education, which I think is a key to our survival and for us to be able to continue maintaining our Coptic identity in such a multicultural society that we are living in. And the second thing that impressed me also very much, which is something that is very dear to my heart and that I will speak about today, and it is divine providence that the gospel today is speaking about the catching of fish or the catching of men. And that is the work that the church is doing here under the guidance of the Blessed Reverend Fathers in mission and evangelism. And it's very clear that the congregation and the priests have an open mind and are returning back to the early glories of the Coptic Church that was very active in the field of mission and evangelism for seven centuries. And I think it is important for us to be able to begin again this work. I heard a lot about the many mission trips that have been done, whether within North America or in Africa or other parts uh, of the world. And I also had the blessing yesterday of seeing the great work that has been done in the Hope Clinic and the Mission Life Center. And these are indeed great projects, and I congratulate you on this and hope to hear more and more success and more expansion about this important work that you are doing with respect to preaching and teaching because this is the divine command of the Lord that he told his disciples to go and to preach to all nations and to every creature and to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And this is something that we have to realize that mission and evangelism is not something optional, but is a divine command that we must all abide by and work diligently to bring the message of the gospel to all nations and indeed to every creature. And this is what this morning's gospel is talking about today, my dear brethren. We see here this amazing miracle that the Lord Jesus Christ does with the disciples in the catching of fish. And the image of fishing here as a metaphor is very clear in this passage. This metaphor of fishing symbolizes the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and gives a picture of the church in the present time as well. The miracle is actually about the catching of men alive, the catching of men alive through the ministry and the means of grace which establishes the church and keeps the church growing even today as Christ continues to draw people into his church through the preaching of the gospel. And we all have an important role to play in this, as I will talk about in a few minutes. The church is called out into the deep, as was Noah in the Old Testament, into the deep of this world and the 
difficulties and the whirlpool of life that people live in and are taken up by the many pleasures of the world, the church is called out to go into the deep of the world and to gather in those people that have either lost the way or they have not even heard about the Lord Jesus Christ as was also at the time of Noah. And also, as the prophets toiled all throughout the night, so did the apostles. When we read in the book of Acts, we see how the apostles suffered for so much for the sake of Christ and for the sake of the gospel and that they went into all of the world to preach the message of salvation and they suffered a lot and they were willing to speak the word of God with boldness being filled with the Holy Spirit and were not afraid to stand in front of kings and rulers and to speak with great power through the power that they had received on the day of Pentecost. So we see, for example, on the day of Pentecost, St. Peter to speak and to give a sermon and through the power of his words filled with the Holy Spirit that it says in the book of Acts that about 3,000 people believed and were baptized. Truly an amazing feat. And when we see St. Peter before the resurrection and how he was in a weak state and how he denied the Lord and after the resurrection and after receiving the Holy Spirit, we see him in a different light, speaking with great power and great strength and indeed that the Lord was with him. Amazing that about 3,000 people can be baptized in one day and what a message that ha would have sent to the whole region. It would have shook, indeed, the whole region, this very powerful event it w which we regard as the birth of the church. I remember when I went to Pakistan in 2006 and baptized 113 people in one day and performed six of the seven sacraments in one event. How exhausting that event was for me and I almost collapsed several times from heat exhaustion, then how much more it would have been for the apostles baptizing 3,000 people in one day. Indeed, the Holy Spirit, who was working in the early church, continues to work in our glorious Orthodox Church today, and we need all to arise and to work with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to fulfill this divine command that his message and his gospel and the message of salvation would reach to every creature and to all nations because certainly we are still very far away from that. Saint Peter also recognizes that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God and his fear comes from being in the presence of this holiness and he felt his sin. He felt how weak he is and that he was indeed in front of the righteous and holy one of God. To capture people alive is to declare to them the kingdom of God in Jesus the Christ and bring them into that kingdom also through the sacraments of the church through which we gain our salvation. So there is no salvation outside of the church and outside of its sacraments. So then this is what the apostles were preaching to the people. Saint Augustine, one of the great fathers of the church, says about the apostles in this miracle, he says they received from him the nets of the word of God they cast them into the world as into a deep sea, and they caught the vast multitude of Christians that we can see and marvel at. Saint Augustine also describes the two boats, saying that those two boats, though, stood for the two peoples, Jews and Gentiles, synagogue and church, those circumcised and those uncircumcised. And also one of the other fathers says, 
he chooses St. Peter's boat and forsakes Moses's. That is to say, he spurns the faithless synagogue and takes the faithful church. And this is what the Lord decided to do to establish his ministry with the church. It is with the church that the Lord establishes this ministry and means to salvation. He says to his apostles, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. The boat sails upon the depths, the deeps of this world, so that when the earth is destroyed, it will preserve unharmed all those it has taken in. Its foreshadowing can be seen already in the Old Testament, for as Noah's ark preserved alive everyone whom it had taken in when the world was going under, so also the church will bring back unhurt everyone whom it embraces when the world goes up in flames. And as a dove brought the sign of peace to Noah's ark when the flood was over, so also Christ will bring the joy of peace to the church when the judgment is over. Saint Cyril of Alexandria says something very wonderful. He says, for the net is still being drawn, the net is still being drawn, while Christ fills it and calls to conversion those who, according to the scripture phrase, are in the depths of the sea. That is to say, those who live in the surge and waves of worldly things. The net is still being drawn there are still many hungry souls that need to know the Lord Jesus Christ, those who live in the surge and waves of worldly things, St. Cyril of Alexandria says. This is what we have been speaking about actually all throughout this weekend, that there are many who are in the depths of living a worldly life without the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In fact, my dear brethren, two-thirds of the whole world do not know the Lord Jesus Christ yet. Two-thirds, two-thirds of the world do not know anything about the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder sometimes that the sign, the big yellow M of McDonald's, is now more recognized than the Christian cross in the world. The sign, the big yellow M that we see in all suburbs and all cities across the globe is now more recognized than the Christian cross. Sometimes even among Christians or nominal Christians, I remember a couple of years ago when I was in America and I was visiting this Armenian man in his business. And we started to talk. And he told me that he was from the Armenian Apostolic Church. And then I began to explain to him that the Armenian Church and the Coptic Church are sister churches. We have the same faith. We believe in the same God. We can practice the sacraments together, we can have communion together, and that we are really one church and we have one belief. And he kept on nodding his head and yes, in agreement, and he seemed that he understood all of this. And we continued our conversation, and then we ended the meeting, and he was seeing me out of his office, and we got to the elevator. And then, and I was wearing a very clear Christian you know, Orthodox cross that I always wear, having the Theotokos, our Holy Mother St. Mary carrying the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we got to the elevator and this Armenian Orthodox man, before I entered the elevator, said to me, oh, by the way, I have a question for you. I said, yes, of course. He said, are you Christian or Muslim? <laughs> so you see, that even some Christians are not living by the message of the gospel and only have the name of Christ uh, as an image, but really their life is far away 
from Christian life at all, let alone then two-thirds of the world that have not even heard about the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't know anything about him. Last week I was in Starbucks with a friend and we were standing in line to get our coffee and an Indian man was standing behind us. And he saw me wearing, of course, my clerical vestments and he said to me, oh, holy Halloween. <laughs> holy Halloween. He thought I was wearing a costume ready for Halloween next week. <laughs> So I said to him, you have the wrong number. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not wearing a, a costume, but this is the vestments we have as Orthodox Christians and that I'm a clergyman in the Coptic Orthodox Church. And then he said to him, oh, yeah, you're the people that worship Haile Selassie, the emperor. I said to him, again, wrong number. These are a cult that use drugs and things like this in Ethiopia. This is not who we are. We are a Christian church, one of the oldest churches in the world. And maybe you should go home and Google Coptic Orthodox Church and then you'll find out who we are exactly. And we ended the conversation there. But imagine how many millions of people here in America are like this that don't know anything about Christ or about Christian denominations. And show, it shows how much work that we as Christians have, and I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ didn't send Coptic Christians here to America for no reason or that this happened by chance, but I think that this is part of God's plan, that we have an important witness here, that many Christians or many Christian churches unfortunately are beginning to deviate away from the truth of the gospel and what the message of the gospel is. And many even Christians are really doubting either their belief or beginning to doubt what their churches are teaching. You look, for example, at what is happening in the Episcopal Church of the USA, and it is a disaster to see how they are completely deviating away from the teaching of the scriptures by ordaining who openly gay homosexual men as bishops in their church and lesbians as women bishops, many of their people are starting to say this is against the teaching of the Bible and this is not God, what God wants for his church. I wonder how such leaders can be actually leaders and how they can be role models and example for their people when they're living such a life when Gene Robinson, he was a married man and had a daughter and divorced his wife and left his daughter and went to live in an openly gay relationship and then his church blesses this and then on top of this, another disaster to ordain him as a bishop. Recently, I was in Singapore attending a conference with Episcopals from the Global South who are very conservative and against this, what is happening here in America. And it was sad to see that one of the bishops here from that church who was in attendance, that his church rejected him and denounced him and removed him from being bishop. Why? Because he was conservative, because he was abiding by the Bible, because he said that homosexuality is against the teaching of the scriptures. So they kicked him out from being a bishop in his diocese. It's funny, isn't it? Because I think that the words of St. Anthony that he said 1,600 years ago are being fulfilled today. St. Anthony said that there will come a day when the mad people will look at the normal people and say, look at these mad people because they are not like us. Huh? And I really believe that we are starting to live in such days now, that what is normal is becoming abnormal and what is abnormal is becoming the new normality in America. And so I believe that our church that has lived according to the teaching of the scriptures has not deviated from this faith that has been handed down to us from generation to generation faithfully. This deposit of faith that the Lord gave to his apostles, we have an important role 
to play in this country to continue spreading that message of the gospel here amongst millions of people that do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. So the net then is still drawn and Christ still calls many, but what is our role in this? He wants us to share in his divine work of transforming hearts and bringing them in from the depths of living such a worldly life. But the question is, are we ready? Are we willing to go into the depths of the fiercest storm and draw in the nets of hungry souls for Christ? Are our churches ready? Are our congregations ready? Are our clergy ready? I'm glad to see that St. Mark's Church here in Washington, D.C. is indeed ready for this work and has really begun in a powerful way. And I hope that you will really continue in this. Because we have to realize that many others are casting nets also, but their nets are full of poison and full of heresy and full of false teachings. People like the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, their magazine, the Watchtower magazine, is according to the New York Times, the most read magazine in the whole world. And also they have people that go knocking on doors and I'm sure you have had them coming perhaps at your doors as well. As well as the Mormons who are very active and baptizing one million people every three years according to their statistics that one million people every three years are being added to the Mormons. They have 60,000 active missionaries preaching in 192 nations around the world. And they give a healthy family image. They speak about Jesus Christ as their savior and as the cornerstone of their faith. But when you understand this cult, you will know that they are worshiping a fake Jesus, not the Christ whom we know as the God and savior of the world. But for them, Jesus Christ was a human being and then attained Godhood later and that he is just one of many gods. And they say that Jesus was formed of 46 chromosomes, 23 from St. Mary and 23 from God the Father in a physical relationship. And yet they are deceptive because they call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They speak the same language as Christians and they use the same terms, but what they mean by those terms are completely different to our Christian understanding of them. So there are many who are casting such nets full of poison, and we have to then awake and arise and begin fulfilling the divine command of Christ to go into the world, because don't think people are going to come to us. Mission is about going out, and this is what the apostles did and this is what happened in the early church, that monks in particular had an important role to play in mission and went to many parts of the world to preach. For example, in Ireland, we know that Irish Christianity has its roots back in Coptic, Egypt, where seven Coptic monks went to preach there. And recently in Ireland, they found the manuscript in a bog that dates back 1,200 years to the 800s which was a Coptic psaltery, a book of Psalms, Coptic book of Psalms they found in a bog, and they took it out and they cleaned it, and then they put it in a museum for display recently, which shows the link between Irish Christianity and Coptic Egypt. So our forefathers and mothers were very active in the mission field, and we need to continue their work here in America because as I said, that mission and evangelism is not optional, but it is a divine command to go and to preach. So we have to be active in this. And now our church has really become a universal church. It is no longer a national church just in Egypt, but it has spread to all continents of the world and indeed in many, many countries. And we have really to think seriously about mission again, and I believe that it should be the central work 
of our church. And we need to think also how to be a welcoming church. The studies tell us that someone decides whether to join a church or not in the first 30 second impression that they get of the church. So imagine from the time that they park their car in the car park and walk to the door of the church and what they see during that time or as they enter into the church and how they are dealt with, that will make them decide whether this is a place they feel comfortable in or not. So if they park in the parking lot and then one of our dear brothers sees someone who looks not Egyptian and they say to him, oh, I think you're in the wrong place. This is an Egyptian church and you should leave. Maybe you're looking for the church across the road then that person obviously is not going to come back to that church again. But if they find the smile, they find someone who is there welcoming them, showing them where to sit, giving them a brochure perhaps about the church or a card where they can fill in their information. Someone is guiding them throughout the liturgy. At the end of the liturgy, the parish priest is welcoming this new person. People go out after the liturgy and go and greet the person rather than everyone hanging with their family and friends that they are accustomed with, but they go out of their way to welcome this new person that may be new in the city or new to the church and invites them for a cup of tea or for a sandwich, sees any way or help that they may need. Straight away, they're going to feel that this is a family atmosphere, that this is a place where they would want to bring up their children and their family. So how? we become a welcoming church is going to be central to our success in mission and evangelism in North America. Because we have to realize, my dear brethren, that the Lord Jesus Christ did not come to save Egyptians only. He didn't just come for Copts. He didn't just come for Egyptians or Sudanese or Ethiopian people. But he said to his disciples to go and to preach to every creature he wants his message to reach to the four corners of the world and to every person that they have the opportunity for salvation in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what is our role in this multicultural society? Because it's not just an American culture, but we have people here from all walks of life. We have Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims and atheists and all these cults I was speaking about dozens of languages that people are speaking. When you look at these cults, they are translating their materials into tens and tens of languages. And I think that we should not just target things in English, but look at translating our books and material in Spanish, in other languages as well, and how to think which groups that we will target in our mission and evangelism work. So let us then, my dear brethren, truly be inspired by the example that our holy apostles did in the early church and what our early church did in the first seven centuries before Islam entered into Egypt and how active we were in that mission field and return back this important work to make it a central theme of everything that we do. There is a beautiful verse which I will end with in the book of Acts, which says, And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. I wonder, can we claim this today in every Coptic church in North America, that every day new people are coming to our church and being baptized and joining the Coptic Orthodox Church? I think we have still a lot of work to do, but at least... We are starting to talk about this again and beginning the work. I'm really very grateful to all of you for your attention, and I again congratulate you on the great work that you're doing through the Mission Life Center and through Hope Clinic, and I wish you every success in this work of mission and evangelism, and glory be to God forever. Amen. <laughs>